We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall, and welcome to The Meaningful Life. We're available on Apple, Spotify, Podbeam, Amazon Music, and wherever you find your podcasts. Do you sometimes feel an imposter? Do you fear if people knew the real you, they would disappear out of your life? Do you feel a fraud at work? Alternatively, you might look sometimes at your partner and think, who are you really? Do I know you at all? Today on The Meaningful Life, we're going to discuss the imposter syndrome with Jungian analyst Susan Schwartz. She was my witness previously talking about daughters and fathers. Go and check out this episode. Today, we're discussing her new book, Imposter Syndrome and the As-If Personality in Analytical Psychology. So let's start off by talking about exactly what are we meaning. What do you mean by the imposter syndrome and the as-if personality? Are they the same thing as far as you're concerned? I think they're in a spectrum. I think what has happened culturally is the popular term is imposter syndrome, but they're quite similar. The as-if personality, to me, implies looking deeper at the issues. Imposter syndrome, the way it is looked upon, or if you check it out on the internet, it's very superficial. And the description of it, as well as really dealing with it, is far too superficial for the complexity of the personality. So they're on a spectrum. For me, the as-if personality represents a deeper look into the issues. So what are the issues? You mention it in your intro. The really awful feeling of, I am a fraud. So many people have come into my office and would say, almost at the beginning first session, I know I am a fraud. Does anybody else know that? No, because they oftentimes are people very able to hide. They learned it from little, to hide themselves, to not be real, to feel shame, which is awful, to be quite astute and adept at then at so much at not being real that they don't know who the real one is, that the real one has been hidden for so long and Culturally, what would I say? They're applauded for being fraudulent and for not being real. Even partners will applaud the one who is not the real self. And how much is this people feeling a fraud and how much is it that they actually are a fraud? Because I think there's a difference between what we feel and actually what we are. Yes, I have found that the people that feel fraudulent are actually not. They oftentimes are very shy inside. It's kind of an interesting word. Withdrawn. Their outer cover is so good. Oftentimes, they're great on the internet, Instagram, all, all kinds of social media. You can see them. They appear wonderful. They're not really a fraud. They just don't know the basics of what it is to be a raw, real person, and that that is what is delightful, not the show. So they got it confused. But the people who don't know they're a fraud. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you, this is interesting when you said that. The people that don't know they're a fraud, I don't see them. They, they, (laughs) They, in a way, they won't come for analysis or therapy because they are too involved with being a con. The other thing that I have found is that sometimes they will come for analysis and therapy and will get to a certain point. And at that point, they will leave because that is the very point that the reality of their being will come through. And they're scared. They're really scared. I mean, I can say, you know, 
Let's work it out. It will come in the dreams. Let's deal with it, etc. But you know, everyone has got so far that they can go. They have got also defenses that they can't get through. And they are, they're basically afraid they'll get rejected. And you know, it's that real, I need to have this defense because otherwise no one will like me. It sounds simple, but it is, again, quite complex. Yeah, and the actual causes of it are obviously quite complex and go right back to childhood. So what's happening in this place where people feel that they, in some sense, have to behave in this fraudulent manner? Usually, well, there's several things that happen early and how each person interprets early experiences is different. But oftentimes they might have been trying to save the family, save the parental figures, save them from themselves. So they then act perfect. They act like not flustered by things. They know how to parent the parent. Oftentimes they were the confidant of one or the other parent figures, and they were lauded for that again. They oftentimes are people, at least in my experience, who are quite adept. They might be smart. It doesn't mean they've gone to a bunch of schooling, but they're smart and they're, they can sense what people need. And therefore, they're quite appealing because they can just read it. They learned very early to read it. And the reason they did that is so that they also could survive. Because if the parents are taken care of, then the thought is maybe they will be as well. What happens is that the development gets arrested because you can't, you have to be a child before you're an adult. And if you're the adult before you're the child, you're going to have to be a child as an adult. It's just what has to happen. And this is what is defended against, is really letting go. Say that again, because I just want to make certain I really heard that. If you are, if you're sort of parentified as a child, yes. when you grow up and become an adult, you're more likely to then sort of become a child. Did I hear that correctly? Well, at least my experience is that one should or has to be a child in life to be a real person. Right. So I now understand you. It's not that you are going to become one, but in yes. a sense, you need to have the space as an adult to discover your child and get to know it. And then you can help it become a real adult as opposed to a fake adult. Exactly. Have I got that right? You've got yeah. it completely right. And this is one of the things that people learn when they're in therapy or analysis. They learn to be, just be, not applauded for doing a lot of accomplishments or achievements, but for who they are as a person. And that is what the imposter syndrome and the as if personality don't know how to do, which is to just be. One, one other thing I would add on to that, we could question, why has this even come up now in our world? It was not a thing, you could say, 25 years ago. However, the as-if personality was described originally in 1942 by a Freudian psychoanalyst named Helena Deutsch. And she said, these people are so superficial, they will not be able to ever figure out their inner world and they will remain superficial, fly-by-nights, etc. That isn't true. It's not true at all. But it took a very long time for a Jungian analyst, another one named Hester Solomon, in the early 2000s to say these people, as if personality, are able to understand what is going on. They are not just fly-by-nights. There is a substance and they need to find it and can. So it's a very different and I think we're talking about two different kinds of as if personalities. We've got the ones that who are aware that, so, you know, they're sending out an avatar. We've now got all the words for this. We're sending out an avatar to go off and do things. 
And then there are people who are sending out avatars, but they have no awareness of that. And maybe you'd see their partners where they're reporting that that they don't really know who their partner is. It's like a performance, but you don't actually get the partner themselves coming to you. Yes, but then also we can ask, why would somebody partner up with somebody like that? And does that as if or imposter person reflect part of them as well? Because Ah. uh we all, all of us, whether we want to admit it or not, do imposter and as if. We just do. Yeah, because I was going to ask you that because I'm sure that if I was in your therapy room, I would see a different person from the person if you were a friend of mine and we were having coffee together. Would you be different people? Well, it's a good question. Or are you talking about different aspects of the same person? So we should be flexible enough to bring all the different aspects out in the appropriate time. So it's fine to have the avatar if you're honest about it. And you're saying, this is my avatar. This is in this situation. In another situation, I am truly myself. The problem is the avatar take over. So let's say your Jungian analyst personality is you, but Mm -hmm. you're looking at a certain range of it because you wouldn't be telling me, you know, about uh, your fright with your sister if I was coming to see you as an analyst. But you might if we were meeting as friends for coffee. That is exactly right. However, hopefully within that, that same core me will show up. So the core me as an analyst shows up in my office and the core me as a friend shows up in that situation. What happens with the imposter and the as if person, they don't differentiate. It's always an avatar. They can't let it go, and it creates no end of inner difficult issues. So this begs another really deep question. Do we actually have a real self? Well, you have just opened the huge door into the chamber of who knows where we can go with that. You know, it it very much depends on which psychological theory you're going by. However, simply, I'll put it simply in how I see it. The self in Jungian psychology, the self, is oftentimes capitalized as something which is larger than us, encompasses us, and related to us. So it's got all these pieces to it. It would be like what carries our potential, our actual and how we connect with who we are now, who we have been, the transgenerational histories, and who we can be. That we, I'm going to extend it really, in relation to the self, is actually a cultural issue as well. So it's personal, but it's also cultural. And that's what I meant about why now the imposter syndrome and as-if personality are culturally up. So let's sort of look at some signs that so if someone thinks they have an as-if personality, what what might be some of the things that would make them so be suspicious of this? I've got a list that I've pulled out what? from you. So Great. I will give you these. You can explain why. And if I've missed anything out, you can add to it. How's about that? Okay. That's perfect. So the first one is a feeling of not belonging. Well, it's a not belonging to oneself. It's a feeling of like an inner distance or a, I'm saying a question to it, because each person I think feels that discomfort in a different way. Not belonging also to the inner self, not really feeling connected. That's the not belonging. It could be to a group, it could be to family, it could be to partner, it could also be to self. But it's the, I don't feel connected deeply. I'm going to add deeply onto it. And that's really what is lacking, is the depth of connection. 
And I think the next one sort of rather builds onto that. Either they feel internally empty or a sort of a feeling of heaviness. Yes, they're they're actually quite similar, aren't they? When you feel heavy, it's like you're burdened. And when you feel empty, you're also burdened in both ways. You don't know how to deal with it. The empty, I think, is an interesting idea because it says, how will I be filled? What am I lacking? But how will I be filled? There's the hope. How can I be filled? The heavy is what is weighing me down so that I can have more freedom, so that I can move easier within myself, so I can have confidence. It's a it is extraordinary how if you turn problems into a question, how it completely utterly revolutionizes it. You know, how can I no longer feel empty inside is a much better question than just saying I feel empty. So sometimes actually getting in contact with these feelings is really positive because you can begin to frame some really useful questions. So the next one I have is low self-worth. Yes, you know. The issue is that most of these people don't look like they have low self-worth. Most people think of them with confidence. They've got it all, a lot of them, not everyone. They are looked upon as successful. Now, that is also determined by culture, background, where they live, who the family is. So it's a, a flexible kind of way. But they are looking other than what they really feel inside. And this one was a surprise to me, a feeling of envy. Well, you know, I put that in because I feel that it's true. And I've heard a lot of people say, this is how they phrase it. I envy others. I can't stand that they envy me. Or I don't ever feel envy. Really? How do you not feel? It's a normal feeling, right? There's a total denial of want and envy itself. They don't want to be envied because they feel the danger in it. And also they very much want to be envied because they want to be on a pedestal. Because if you're on a pedestal, nobody knows you. They don't get close, distant. It's safer. You send out an appealing but elusive personality. Well, yes. You know, I can, I can kind of tell When someone walks in my office, I don't want to say that I really know, but I can kind of tell. There's a certain cover. You can feel it. There's a cover, not just in my office. You can probably feel it as well. And there's there's an, an appeal to that person, partly because they're quite distant. We naturally want to get closer. So we try to get closer to the one with this rather aloof appeal. Again, learned very early to protect because they're scared. So if you can get through under that, the real person begins to appear. This one I will have to take a little bit of a while to break down, and that is the denial of shadow. So what is shadow and why might we deny it? Well, all right, I'm going to use Jungian terminology or definition of shadow because Most people actually have figured it out whether they read Jung or not. It's usually the darker side, the not darker, but you know, the side that we don't know, the side that we haven't used either. Our unused potential is also shadow. So it's not really just negative. It's what we've ignored, development that has not occurred, is yet to occur. Why do we need to have shadow? Well, you know, the fairy, not the fairy tale, the the story of Peter Pan. Peter Pan went in search of his shadow. You can't live without it. And you also can't just appear as a shining object all the time because it's not real. So the shadow makes us real and we have to look at what we don't want to see. It can be good things. It can be not such good things. The shadow also is current. It's always culturally as well. We can see it in the world. We are so many shadow elements. And what we easily do with the shadow is we say, 
so-and-so is awful. That's really not right and incomplete. The imposter and the as-if person wants to get rid of their shadow because they're threatened by what they haven't done yet, what they want to hide, what they need to do, need to do. Because I think a lot of people have a sense that they have been performing, that they might have an as-if personality when they sort of reach the middle of their their life and they begin to ask themselves questions like, you know, why am I here? Who am I? All of these sort of what are often called midlife questions. That's when you sort of might begin to think that you might have an as-if personality. Am I getting this right? I think you are. I'm going to make it a little more complex, which is that, and a bit of a question, as we are living longer, does that very midlife story continue longer? And does it arise quite later in life as well? Because that question actually leads to development. What have I not done? What do I want to do? Who am I really? And who I am 10 years ago is not who I am now. So who am I? Yeah. And what do I want to do? What are my roles? Not the ones that I was given by my parents. Because, you know, if you're still living your parent, what your parents want when you're 40, that's a little bit tragic, really, isn't it? It's very tragic. And also, one has then not really done the life cycle stages. Are you remaining a child? Or are you, you know, again, kind of a false adult? What did you leave behind that you need to pick up? I think that the crisis, I actually think, although painful, the crisis should happen throughout life because it wakens you. It shakes you out of your facade. And that's what is so difficult is how do I take off the facade? Be me, not in a too naive way, but in a real way. And it will be different than what we imagine. There's the threat, I think. It's different than what we imagine. So if somebody's listening to this podcast and they're thinking, hmm, I wonder if I'm sending out an avatar into the world rather than being myself, I'm sort of thinking we're going to say, hurrah, that's a wonderful thing to be thinking because it could bring a lot of growth. Am I hearing that correctly? I, I think the, yes, I think the act of reflection brings a lot of growth. And I think people can quite easily evaluate who they are sending out into the world if they look at their social media and if they are really being honest about putting their real self out there. It's far more enchanting to have one's real self in pictures, in videos, in short uh, clips. The real self is what is intriguing. So let's imagine that I want to get in contact with my real self as opposed to this as-if personality. How do I go about doing it? So again, I'm going to give you some ideas that relate to my background as an analyst. One's dreams. You know, your dreams will really tell you very clearly, you're being false here. Here's the false one coming along and you are attracted to this false one. It, it comes in the dreams. You get a real I want to go there. It's got a lot of power. I want to go there. I want to betray myself. The dreams also say, aha, uh -huh, this is the real you. This is your potential. This is what can evolve. And I think it's not just having dreams. It's writing them down, thinking about them a little. You can't spend five hours a day thinking about dreams. It's ridiculous. Won't work. You're supposed to live. How do I live it? How am I living that dream? So what comes to mind is Jekyll and Hyde that came from a dream. So it would represent the two parts of his personality and which one's going to win out, the real one, the false one, or are they both false? So the stories, the, the dreams really help us evaluate and reflect on our life. People keep journals. They also learn to talk to their partners, to their friends, to be honest. Sometimes people, I mean, I think because of what I do, going into analysis and therapy, 
helps because you've got a witness. You used that word earlier. You've got a witness with you, not above you, but with you to go the journey. And this is what was lacking from early in life was the experience of somebody with. It's just essential. Somebody who actually sees you. Yes. And people can tell if they're being seen. And this is the desire in the imposter syndrome and the as if personality. I really want to be seen. I'm afraid to be seen because being seen was not either safe. It didn't work. They were disappointed. So naturally you try to avoid it, but the desire, because it's human and very strong desire to be seen is just essential. So you get into a situation like that. Because I tend to find I get a lot of people pleasers who want to be whoever you want them to be, sort of kind of thing. And with them asking the question, what do I want? You know, what are, what are my feelings about this is quite a revolutionary idea. It's a challenging idea. When you've been hiding um, to be faced with, in a way, what you're saying is, who are you really? So being faced with that challenging question in what actually sounds quite innocent can throw a lot of people off course. And it's the challenge of our times, isn't it? Who am I really? Mm. It's, yeah. it's really the challenge of us, yes. Because when I when I went, I started my midlife journey, I, by a lucky coincidence, was given the James Hollis book, The Middle Passage. Mm -hmm. And he asks you to ask yourself three questions. What makes my life meaningful? Well, I've got a whole podcast on that one, so I'm doing quite well on that one. What are my roles as opposed to the ones I was given? And, you know, what are my values as opposed to the values of other people and society? And I'm doing really well on those. The third question, which is, who am I? I find that a really difficult question. Well, I think it is a difficult question. My thought is that it isn't one to be pinned down. It's how can I use myself flexibly? Who am I in many different ways? forms? And am I through my entire life developing? Because as you develop, you find meaning and challenge. And the, I'm going to use the word again, desire to live and to grow, not to just sit around and coast. All the things you mention are not coasting things. They take a lot of energy and it's an energy that replenishes the system. And I like that answer. It's really helpful because I think I was trying to pin it down to one answer. And the fact that actually, who am I is a multitudinous answer is quite helpful. So thank you for that. So what about spotting your partner is an imposter? Perhaps they're playing the loving spouse, but you've discovered they're a serial cheat or they've been running up huge debts behind your back. Are those sort of kind of signs that you might have an as-if personality partner? I think so. It, this whole, what I'm describing, it has also a line of narcissism within it. And this is what you're saying in a way in those examples. It's all about them. And there is also something about finding the real truth of who you are with, which gives you the challenge to say, what am I doing here? Who am I? Is this meaningful? And to ask those questions together. What shall we do? This is a mess. What shall we do? And really calling it as it is. I found that a lot of people are very hesitant to say the obvious, to need to cover it over and not say, you know what, you just spend too much money. What's going on? What is going on? Simple question, difficult to ask. So you don't call out your partner as a narcissist, you just call out the behavior. I think you also call out your feelings because one is, in, well, yes, you can. You can say, you know, you're, you're being narcissistic in the sense that 
You've forgotten about us. You forgot about our connection. And I went along with it. You know, you have to admit your part in the process. I went along with it. What was I doing? Let us discuss it. Let's figure together. Should we do it differently? What does this mean? Is this a crisis in our relationship? Have we gone as far together as we can? It it really brings that up. Because often if somebody's on a pedestal, you've put them on that pedestal. (laughs) And you need to have them on the pedestal so they will remain distant because they then will never know you. You see, so both people are colluding to create distance, disconnection, lack of intimacy. Both are colluding. And that's difficult. It's easy to take the speck out of somebody else's eye, but rather difficult to take the plank out of your own, isn't it? (laughs) Well, you have to admit that you've got a plank in your eye, you see. And And that's why I said, talked about shame, because you really have to get into, oh my goodness, this is me also. You can't just say it's you. You have to say it's me. You use a metaphor of stripping off the veils. Yes. Um, can you can you expand on that? Because I think if we're going to be turn up as as closer to our real self as possible, we need to take off a few of these veils. Yes, I used the word facade earlier. It's like the veils. You know, you take one off, and then you take another, and you take another, and you keep on. You just like the onion, and gradually you get to the core. I think it's a question as well. Do we ever get to our absolute self? I don't really think so. I don't know that that is the goal. The goal is figuring out either what's in the way, how to get filled, how to be real. But you can't be real if you've got the veils on. Even if you've got a little one, you know it. And you really need to take it off. It's hard because part of those veils mean that they're up there to create illusion. If you see me as marvelous, I'm going to be marvelous. That's part of it. And, you know, we might be rather attached to being marvelous. It's rather nice, isn't it? <laughs> well, you see, there's the, there's the issue. Why do we have to give up being marvelous? Could we not be marvelous and be real as well? Do you get a double on that one? You get really appreciated, you get fulfilled, the empty gets filled with marvelous in the right way. You don't have to sacrifice marvelous. You want to live it truly from your heart. Not if the veils don't work, because then you can't feel. See, that is the other piece that I think you haven't mentioned yet, which is this ability to be too numb, which we have in our current culture and our world. We get numbed out, and then we don't really feel physically as well. The body is like separated from the mind, and we are not feeling. We should feel the heaviness of the veils. We should feel uncomfortable living behind them. Should, yes. I use that guardedly, but it's more, what happens if I'm open and feel? We have a lot of mechanisms in our world to not feel. What one, I think, is our avatar and how we hide behind social media, facade, intellect. We can do it in a variety of ways. Yeah, I'm great hiding behind my intellect. Yes. And it's a great mechanism. As you know, it works. The thing is using it in a very real way. So you can say you hide behind it. But you could also say, oh, wait a minute, that is me. And I'm using it consciously. But what I sort of began to realise is that I was sort of almost seeing myself as a brain carried around on a lump of meat. And I sort of needed to actually get into my body a whole lot more. Yes, I feel that as well. Most people that I see also are distanced from their body in a variety of ways. We're very adept at it. We can do it food, alcohol, drugs, internet, pornography, who knows? All these things help distance ourselves. And what an uncomfortable feeling that must have been, as you said. And it really is. It's like, wait a minute, am I feeling really myself 
all day long. I ask people, do you ever look in the mirror? Not out of vanity, which actually isn't a bad thing, but it isn't a bad thing, but much more to really see, how do I look? Is this me? And what do I feel? What do I feel? Yeah. And I think that's a really useful question. Whenever you're you're feeling something, but you're not quite certain what it is, to actually stop, you know, you're in the lift, you've got two seconds where you're doing absolutely nothing. Ask yeah. yourself, how am I feeling? Because you're going from one place to another, you're going to have feelings about it. You know, you're about to walk into your dentist's office or whatever. What are the feelings? Because, you know, as well as the panic, there might be other feelings there as well. At least I'm talking for myself when we're going to the dentist's office there, but you know what I no, mean. No, I, th- I think you're actually talking for a lot of people. But you see, in our world, generally, the going from one place to the other is usually you're supposed to be able to be adept at change. Move from one thing to the other fast. The two seconds we eliminate. We need the two seconds to admit, you know, I'm absolutely freaked out going to the dentist. I hate it. Actually, I don't want to be here. I know I need to be here. I'm going to say I'm upset. I'm going to tell the dentist I am worried because this doesn't feel very good. It's revealing this is me. And sometimes it might not be panic. The feeling might just be anxiety. But because you haven't actually examined the feeling that you don't actually know. Well, and you know, I think there is something valuable about not knowing and saying, I don't know. I find it is so freeing in a way when someone, for instance, brings a dream and we can't figure the dream. And we have to say, I don't know. I don't know. Let's table it. Let's remember it. Let's keep it. And I'll bet something will come up, which will give knowledge in the future. So it's a actually a very interesting and opening process to say, I don't know. And to open yourself up to the, the idea that if you say, I don't know, you might actually get some help answering the question in some, in some kind of way. You're going yes. to read something in the newspaper. You're suddenly going to open up an article in the, in the newspaper or online, and it's going to present you the information that you need. Yes. Well, you said that earlier when you said that you got a book which really kind of solidified some things for you. Well, it wasn't lucky. It was synchronous. It was the right time. It's the right time. And that is such an amazing thing. It's almost like you can ask the atmosphere. So give me something here. I need something. Or you're, whether you ask or don't, you're asking. And the world comes. The unconscious is answering you. It could be you've been drawn to this particular podcast because it's actually answering that question for you. We might be that very thing today. We might. And hopefully, we would also be leading to the place where I don't know is all right, and I'm anxious or nervous, and that's all right as well. And I'm taking off the veils, little by little. You you don't take them all off at once. Little by little. Yeah. So it's not a strip tease act. It's just a sort of a bit of a tease. It's a good strip tease act. That's exactly a way to do it. One garment at a time. Yes. <laughs> the yes. sort of Gypsy Lee Rose version where you just take off a glove. Yes, but you see, for but that's right. Because for so many people, a glove is a lot. They've had the glove forever. So to take the glove off. It's just huge. And we are stopped because we feel we've got to be naked and, you know, just take the glove off. Yeah, because that's false too. To be naked, you you, you know, you can't go. They don't let you in the restaurant if you're naked. <laughs> so, so you have to be naked in the right instance, clothed in the right instance, in a way that is true to who you are. Okay, in a moment, we're going to look deeper into a particular issue and let's see what we're going to learn from that. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter 
Like us on Facebook and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. So if you'd like to participate in The Meaningful Life, you can go to my website, www.andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast. And there you'll find a participate in the show. And this is what I've had sent to me. My husband, Mike, and I have been together for 21 years and married for 13 of those. I always saw us as having a family together, as did Mike. But life sort of got in the way, or did we let it? Those first years of marriage saw me start an intense job in London. This meant for the first three-ish years of married life, we lived apart, seeing each other only at weekends. Mike gave up a job he did not like and joined the Merchant Navy, working away from anywhere from five weeks to four months. For me, this is where everything changed. I suppose when I saw us having a family, I saw us being together for it. Without me really noticing it, the clear vision I'd had of waving off to work with two small children next to me vanished. While Mike was away, I focused on my career, and I suppose never did have that light bulb moment that so many women talk about to have children. I'd also been brought up to work, 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 and this translated for me as feeling like a failure if I didn't. Deep down, I knew that Mike did want a family. But when your time together is so punctuated with time apart, why spoil those precious moments with big, difficult discussions, right? A couple of years ago, Mike told me his position. He would like children and that the ball was in my court. That was the phrase he used. And I felt left with this massive decision to make on my own. He doesn't now mention it. It's almost like the elephant in the room and it consumes me every day. Some days I think, yes, I want this. Other days, I find the idea imprisoning. My thoughts are so intensely governed by my hormones that I don't know which ones to believe. And this indecision has hurt Mike irrevocably. We have seen counsellors separately about this. It came to a head just over 12 months ago when Mike's therapist told him I obviously didn't love him or I would have had a family with him. So now he says he doesn't know what love is anymore, nor if he loves me but her words couldn't be further from the truth. Mike is my world. For me, he is all I need. Family or no family with Mike, I don't need anything else. Maybe this is the problem. Mike feels we're perhaps too old now to start a family. I feel like a monster, and I feel such rage at myself. If only I could turn back time. If only I'd told him how I struggled with him working away, instead of staying quiet because I wanted him to be happy. It's like grief. Sometimes it hurts so much, I don't know how to cope. We've been talking more openly about everything this past year, and neither of us wants to end our marriage, but nor can we see a way to move forward. Help. So, a lot of material here, Susan. Where where would you start? Well, you know, I'm struck by the point of reaching out to you. Also, the articulateness of the letter really says there's something inside of her that is both, it's a hard word, regretful, but also really not knowing what happened. Time. Where was time? Also, where is value of oneself? And there there seems to be a conflict in a traditional role and what is really right for her and him. Their communication was not so good for years. I don't know that it's just when people are separate by space physically, that's one thing, but they sounded separated in their deeper communication for a long time. They've got a lot to talk about. It's heartrending, actually. It's heartrending. So the first thing is, I think she needs to have a, a better sense of whether she wants children or not. And the place I would like to ask her to start with is about her relationship with her mother. Because when I've had clients that have trouble deciding whether they want to be a father or mother, when you get deep into it, 
often the reason we find it difficult to be a mother or father is because something actually didn't go 100% right with our own relationship with our mother or our father. I'm going to add both, the mother and father fears, because something obviously did not go right. When it goes right, one's sense of self is stronger. You know who you are and what not what role you want, but what what means of fulfillment are going to be right for you in your life. And that sense of self has to be strong enough to decide for oneself, not just drawn along in a place that is unspoken and not known if it's wanted or not. As well, I would say, both of them need to go back and figure out what did they learn about being themselves and what did they learn about relationship from the parental relationship. And I would have to say also, what did you learn about what it means to be a mother in this case? You know, what lessons did you get about motherhood? Because this sense that you have to work, 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 that immediately gets my, you know, my curiosity going. Why do you have to work, work, work and prove yourself? I'm going to add another piece to it, which is what were the emotions of the mother and father in being parents? And were they depressed? Were they worried? Were they distant from each other? Exactly. Because as you were reading, I thought the mother of this woman, both parents, they sound unhappy. Being a parent does not sound rewarding. It sounds like duty. And you can avoid it all if you work, work, work. Equally, you avoid your life in a huge way. You avoid all the reflection that this woman so articulately could put into the letter. But for all these years, it was avoided. What a shame. Mm. However, it's recoverable because she's reaching out. I just wondered also, classically, if your childhood has not been so rewarding, interestingly enough, some people want to change that by having children. Other people want to not bring anybody into the world. I think she learned that one. So... (laughs) We're going to sound like two therapists here. I think you need to investigate your own childhood a little bit. The quality of it and find what was rewarding and what was very difficult because she's not living child. All she does is work. So where is the play? Where is the life? Where is joy? This seems missing in their relationship. Joy? And they both made, they equally made the decision to have work be in between, work is in bed between the two of them. So they've got both intimacy issues. And why? How does love get expressed? And if it was held in all these years, that's what I think is difficult, held in. And I think it's terribly unfair that the husband has put the ball in her court. I mean, you know, talk about uh, passing... As it, the S H I T sandwich onto somebody else. Yes. yes, absolutely. To my knowledge, it's not only in one court. You have to have two courts here. And he's abdicating his own potency. He's saying, I'm not potent. And the other thing that he is saying is, I am going to listen to what somebody else says and tell you what they say because they're more right than either of us. I feel very uncomfortable if someone does that with my words. I don't Mm. think it's well thought. I think it's just pasted on. Here's the as if. I'm not going to show up. I'll use so-and-so's words, not my own. I also wonder, if you give over to another person any decision, why are you opting out of it? That's the question. Why? Does he really want to be married? That's what I thought. And I don't know if she does either. Even though she loves him, what is love there? That is another question. What is love? I I think it is a question that 
the imposter syndrome person and the as if personality have difficulty with. What is love really? We all have issues with it, but what does it mean to me? I don't know what it means to these people. And what does it generally mean for an imposter? Is it something that's performed rather than felt? Is that what you're saying? I think it is. I think it is. And a distance from the body as well. So they perform sex, but do they really feel it? Or they perform a conversation, do they really feel it? The feeling is what is compromised. And I'm wondering about the feeling level between these two people. It seems sacrificed. I don't know why. So I think summing up, the first thing I'm going to say is only you're going to take only 50% of the blame rather than 100%, which you're taking at the moment. So we can go, ah, because we've taken half the blame off you. And what I think I really, really want is you to take up the idea of Susan is actually really feeling your feelings. And I think really sharing them with him with your husband, you know, I'm feeling it's unfair that I've been given 100% of this burden because effectively, you know, we drove this carriage together. And, you know, this is how I'm feeling. I'm angry with myself. Actually, I'm a little bit angry with you as well. You know, it's okay to be angry with your partner. Let's have the true feelings in as much as possible. And I think I would like to have you both of you talking about, you know, what you learnt to be about being a parent from your parents. What was it like being a child in your household beyond the top line that probably you hid behind? Like, you know, I had a great childhood, but you don't actually investigate further behind that. Go behind, or I had a miserable childhood, go behind the front page headlines because the reality is going to be what's going to help you move forward with this. Yes. I'm going to add to that as well, that both of them how they feel about their own bodies and what did they learn about love and affection and showing affection from their parents. Why is that an important question? It's how we learn. We learn non-verbally. We learn how people treat themselves and each other, the parental figures, how they treat us, and then we treat ourselves the same way. So I would say, in addition to what you're saying, how to get in touch with their physical selves, and also how they express love, because there's something very incomplete there. So we touched earlier in the program a little bit about narcissism. We're going to be talking in the bonus material about ageing as if personality and narcissism. That's what we're going to be discussing later. But before we finish, I normally end up by asking people what makes their life meaningful, which I've already asked you once before. So I'm going to rephrase the question slightly. What have you done recently that you found meaningful? Wow. Huge question. I'm so glad that you asked me. Yes. A huge question. Meaningful has been, I'm going to try to be specific and not specific, expression of myself in ways that I never thought possible before, and a continuation and really an expansion of my professional life, my personal life. There has been more growth and development than I had ever assumed. And I have been continually surprised at the present and how it has expanded and in the process, how it has brought me absolutely back to my past. So I've been living more fully in the present because I have many more possibilities than I ever thought. And also in the midst of all the future and present possibilities, which is exactly things that I want also and have always wanted, I'm still going back to the past and bringing it forward so it will ignite my present and my future. Because there was a sentence in your book that I really liked, and you've sort of brought me back to it. And you said, once the past is understood, the present can expand. Yes. Well, I think I just said it. Yes. It's this kind of the excitement of this continual loop. Not, Not one is not finished, but it's a continual loop. Back, present, forward, back, present, forward. It's the movement is what is exciting. 
And that place where we all have this, well, you're already somewhere, aren't you satisfied? It's not that one is not satisfied. It's that there is development always to be had. As long as we're still here, why not? And you can teach old dogs new tricks, despite what my mother used to say. Yes, but you see, as long as the old dogs keep their energy going by taking care of their body, mind, and soul, yes, and then they remain within the youth that is always there while not denying their age. Okay, well, hold that thought because we're going to expand on that in just a moment. If you want to hear the bonus material, you can subscribe directly via Apple or Spotify. We're also available on Amazon Music. And if you want to become a supporter of The Meaningful Life and unlock the bonus material this way, here are the details. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.